Welcome to a video that I like to call the deep dive video, and I always want to explain that. The last thing I want to be accused of is creating some kind of clickbait. So I explain what the meaning is behind this video, which may be in a bit of a different context than what you think when you see this particular thumbnail. My definition of deep dive as it applies to this video is that I look at hundreds and hundreds of charts each week. I don't use all of those charts in all the different videos that I upload. At the very end of the weekend, I go through and I look through the charts and those that are still important, but I really didn't talk about this past week, I include those in this video. I also have some other charts that are unique just to this video because the idea is with the videos that I post each day and each week taken together, this should give you a really comprehensive look at what is happening in the stock market in general, and then the S&P 500 more in particular. This is being prepared for Monday, March 18th. The first is a chart that I usually use every day. It was a staple of the daily videos. It's called the Ulcer Index. And as its name applies, when things are going down and people are freaking out, the you're getting more of an ulcer that's being created because most people are long in the market. Well, lately, well, actually, since about oh, the middle part of November, we've been flatlining with this. This is a, an attempt with many indicators that I use to measure sentiment. How are people feeling in the market? And we're just flatlining here right now. So I dropped using this chart in the daily videos until it starts to show us something. And you can see even the moving average is going down. Now, at some point, this chart will be included again in the daily videos. But for right now, I'm just like a broken record is nothing really seems to change. Then this is another chart that sometimes is very useful. This attempts to measure risk on when people are favoring stocks versus risk off when people may be getting out of stocks or getting into more conservative stocks. And there are times when this ratio really zips up and it really zips down. Well, since the beginning of 2024, we've been just chopping around. Now, the last couple of days, we've seen a little bit of weakness in the market in Thursday and Friday session. <clears throat> so this ratio is going down just a little bit, but it's not really telling us all that much. And unless it really breaks to the downside or turns and starts to break to the upside, I haven't been showing this chart either. And this is a chart of the VIX. Now the VIX is on here, but it's invisible. The VIX is a fear gauge. When the VIX goes up, that means there's a lot of fear in the market. When the VIX goes down, that means there's not much fear in the market. Well, when the VIX was originally designed, it was meant to be used with static numbers, 12 or so on the downside, that means there's no fear in the market. And 20 to the upside, that means there's a lot of fear in the market. Well, just by looking at this here, this is a 50 period exponential moving average because the VIX has been turned invisible. This can plot what is the range over a longer period of time. When the market really is under a lot of pressure, like during the great financial crisis, we went up into a higher range. And then as we were coming up out of that and going up with the market, we went into a lower range. Then we had the COVID plunge. We went up into a higher range, and now it looks like we've been developing a lower range again as stocks have been setting recent all-time highs. We don't use this to make decisions. This is really more informational, and this is chart. This is one of those charts that's just unique to this video. Then this sometimes is used in the daily video. We want to measure how fast is the VIX going, because if this is really going up or down quickly, that can usually mark some kind of exhaustion. Well, when, we're, when stocks are going down, the VIX goes up. And the last reading we had here was an extreme positive reading when we were declining. Right now, we're just about at the midpoint. So we're not getting an extreme positive or negative reading. So there's been no need to show this chart. Another way of looking at the VIX is I take the VIX and then a correlation of the S&P to the VIX. And this creates a ratio. And sometimes when we get above this dashed line, this shows that the market is getting quite nervous at this point. We may, we may not be seeing this in the VIX or in some other indicators that we look at, but this had spiked up a couple of times. Now, the market ended up going up after that, but we've now dropped down into more of a neutral type of a reading, so there hasn't been a need to show this chart. Another one that's similar to that is the VIX is based on at-the-money options. The SKU index is based on out-of-the-money options. When we get up into this red area, the market is expecting some kind of a big move. And when we finally top out, turn, and come back down, 
you can see sometimes that marked the top, sometimes it marked the bottom, sometimes just a continuation. We were getting some readings recently, and we are going back up right now, but we haven't gone back up into this red area yet. As long as we stay down below this, there's really no need to show this chart. Then we have the move index on top, which measures the volatility of bonds. The VIX, which measures the volatility of stocks. That's in the middle. Here's a study that I had here where I take the VIX and I subtract the move index. That gives us a green line. That means the VIX is going up more than the move index right now. Stocks are more volatile than bonds. Where I really look at is on the bottom with the correlation. When we get a really high reading here, that means the move index and the VIX are going in the same direction at the same time. They were having a tendency to go in opposite directions. Now they've worked themselves back to more of a neutral reading. So this chart really isn't giving us any additional insight. Then we take the VIX and the move index and we do a ratio. And this creates a jagged line over a period of time. And then I plot a moving average on top of this. When we're going down, that tends to mean stocks are going up. When this is going up, that tends to mean stocks are going down. What we're seeing is kind of interesting right now. We've been setting recent all-time highs with the S&P, but since the beginning of 2024, we've been seeing the moving average of the VIX to move ratio actually going up. And we're seeing that in the VIX itself, and now it's also coming over into this ratio. It may mean that folks are just doing more hedging because they're getting a little nervous about market conditions. This is another fear gauge. Sometimes it's really screaming to the upside. That means that fear is increasing. Sometimes it's really coming down. That means fear is decreasing. But since the beginning of 2024, we pretty much have been chopping sideways. So this hasn't been that useful. Another one that just keeps going lower and lower right now, this is another fear gauge. When this is going down overall, that just means fear has been decreasing. And here is the same risk on risk off chart. So just in case you missed it before. All right. Then another thing that we look at is how far away are we above the all-time high that was set in early 2022? Even with the down days that we saw on Thursday and Friday, we're still 6.19% above the previous all-time high in the S&P. Then stock charts has this thing called technical alerts. And I follow these while the market is open. This creates a whole list. I don't have Monday on here because it just went crazy. Their software had some kind of a bug and the list was just a mile long. So I had to start it with Tuesday's session. Now I look at these on an intraday basis and I go over each day in the daily video, but this is the whole week excluding Monday this past week. When we see it's blue or green, that tends to be positive. When we see a lot of red, that ends up being more negative. So we can kind of get at a glance what's happening here. And this looks not only at the S&P, but different markets, different sectors, when they do something positive, when they do something negative. TSX, this is Canada, so it keeps that in mind. That's the only international index that these that is triggered with an alert here. But this kind of gives you a, a visual look at whether we're, we're more positive or negative. And then another thing that Stock Charts does is we have five indexes that I follow. Now, the benchmark of everything that I do and the foundation is all in the S&P 500. I teach classes on that. I do strategies on that. I don't do individual stocks. I do everything that's focused around the S&P 500. Well, we want to know where is the S&P 500 in relation to other indexes? Well, the other indexes that we follow are the Dow, the mid caps, the small caps, and the NASDAQ 100. And then stockcharts.com rates those on a score from zero to 100. The higher the score, the better looking the technical chart. The idea behind this is it's trying to remove emotion from the, the equation by just coming with a more objective manner of evaluating what the chart is looking like. And for the first time in quite a while, we have the S&P in first place. For most of the last year or so, since we've been bouncing, really since October 2022, it's been the QQQs that have been in first place. Then last week, the mid caps were actually in first place. Well, we're seeing some weakness right now in the QQQs. The S&P, which they have stocks that overlap. There, there are stocks that are in the NASDAQ 100 that are also in the S&P 500. But since there's over 500 stocks in the S&P, there's a lot of more conservative and even value type companies. So when the QQQs are under pressure, which is pretty much only tech, this, meaning the S&P 500, tends to stand up a little bit better. And it's coming in first place this week with a score of 81.8. 
Then in second place, still not doing that bad. It's number two after all, are the QQQs, which is the NASDAQ 100 at 78.8. And then the mid caps are still holding up fairly well. They're coming in third with a score of 77.7. Then we have the Dow, which are the considered to be the bluest of the blue chip, the, the real foundation of the US economy. My problem with that is it's only 30 stocks. So you get one stock that's up or down in a big way and it can impact the Dow where if you see that in the S&P, it doesn't have that much of an impact, but the Dow is coming in with a score of 60.5. And then in last place are the small caps at 52.8, which ended up having a pretty negative week and underperformed the rest of the market. Then looking at a short-term rainbow chart, and I say, I look at all of this together. I try to take in the whole chart to get a big picture look. And then these are moving averages from 10 to 50 periods. And then they're color coordinated here to make it look kind of cool. And we just look at where is current price in relation to all of these lines. And when, even though we've been coming down lately, we're still above all of the lines in the short term. And so for right now, the short term trend is still holding up. Then this is one of our short term indicators. This is usually in most of the daily videos. If we get going with any conviction up or down, this is the Williams percent R and it's pretty touchy. It can ride extreme positive. It can ride extreme negative for long periods of time. Well, since we've been shifting around a little bit, it's more neutral right now as it's trying to figure out what's happening. Then another short-term indicator is called the Commodity Channel Index or CCI. This is a real favorite indicator amongst some people. I've done a lot of research on it. I just haven't concluded what other people have when it comes to how you read this chart. I use it just like an oscillator. We're looking for extreme positive or negative readings. We've come down to pretty much the neutral point. This one is based on 14 periods. And then we have another one here that's based on 20 periods, a little longer out. And this is a boom indicator. And this is an indicator that I developed decades ago. I just never gave it a name. And I was attending an online webinar and somebody was showing what I'm trying to, to see with this indicator. And they went, boom, boom, boom. And so I just called this the boom indicator. And really all this does is it measures how far away are we with price from a particular moving average. This is the 20 period, the 50 period, and the 200 period. Now, when we get too far away, you can see that the, the moving average acts like a magnet or a rubber band. And price will have a tendency to go far away, and then it'll come back to the moving average. And that's what this is trying to measure. And the way this is set up, we look for extreme positive or negative readings. We were getting some extreme readings, but now we've dropped down as the market has been under pressure. We were also extreme positive with the 50, and now it's starting to come back down. We're still looking more positive and it's going up. That means stocks are going up when we look at the 200 period moving average. Then some intermediate term charts, another rainbow chart. This is going from 50 periods up to 100 periods. Price is still above all of the lines in the rainbow. And even though we've been declining a bit over the last few days, the intermediate term trend is still positive. Bollinger bands can be used, <clears throat> excuse me, in a number of different ways. And all these videos that I do, they're all take one. I just hit the button and go. That's why I trip over my words and you hear me clear my throat because I was spending so much time editing the video that it was just taking too much time. All right. But Bollinger Bands can be used. They were developed by John Bollinger. There's, he even wrote a book about it. You can see where is price based on the midpoint between the upper and lower Bollinger Band. How far are the bands from each other? Are the bands going up? Are the bands going down? Well, another thing that we look at is called the percent B. When we close outside of the upper or lower Bollinger Band, we don't do that very often. And the market spends a very few percentage amounts of time, either extreme positive or negative. And so that's what we try to measure here. And there are times when this does happen, but right now we are declining, but we're still above the midpoint. So we're still looking positive, but we're not getting an extreme reading here. And this is an anchored moving average. And this is different from a regular moving average where regular moving averages look at right now and then measure backwards, 20 periods, 50 periods, 200 periods. Well, an anchored moving average allows you go back to go back to a previous significant point, and then it draws a moving average going forward. Now, we're far away from this kind of maroon line here right now, 
This did come into play last October when we were really going down, but we're far away from the line currently. Then we have a thing called the Connors RSI, which is another oscillator. We look for extreme positive or negative readings. We're not seeing that right now, so I haven't been showing this. This is the 50 period moving averages. Now we're really keeping an eye on the 20 period moving averages. That's the short term support. And as, the, as of now, when I record this, before the market opens on Monday, March 18th, we're still above the 20 period moving average. So that support level is holding. We're wondering if it breaks, then the next area of support that we're gonna be watching is the 50 period moving averages. And I use both because people ask me, what's better, a simple exponential moving average or an exponential moving average? Did I say that right? A simple moving average or an exponential moving average? And there's, you can make a case for either side. So I plot them both on here. But we're still far above the 50 period moving average for right now. So there's been no need to show this. The same thing is true with the 100 period moving averages. We're far away from that. If we really see some kind of a decline, they may come into play. Then we're still measuring the distance of how far above are we from the 200 period simple moving average. And we're still about 11.83% as of Friday's close. We got up into the 13% area and that may have been a little bit overextended. We're, we're seeing some of our longer term trend indicators looking extreme positive. We have a 150 and a 200 period simple moving average and they've been extreme positive for a long time. And so we might see a bit of a pullback here until things get a little bit more under control. But at the same time, that's also showing good momentum. When we see a lot of these indicators all giving us extreme positive ratings, it doesn't always mean we're gonna reverse and go in the other direction. It just means that it, the market's really strong right now. This is standard deviation. This tries to measure speed, it doesn't measure direction. It just measures how fast based on the last 10 periods is this index, or you could plot this on a stock, how fast is it going up or down? When we're below the moving average, that means we're not moving all that fast. And then we want to keep an eye on the S&P 100, which is the bigger are the biggest stocks that make up the S&P 500, just to see if we're seeing any major negative divergences here. And they're not really diverging from each other. This is just a measurement going from the low that we set back in October until where we closed on Friday. We're up just a little under 20%. And then you might be seeing some resistance. That's a round number. That's a percentage move. And somebody might program some of these algorithms to say, okay, we got in right about at the low here back in October when we see a 20% profit in the S&P start selling. And that's just one possible thing that could be happening. Then we have a thing called the CMB Composite Index. This is supposed to be a standalone trading system. I use it like an oscillator where we look for extreme positive or negative readings. We did have one earlier in March, but right now we're not seeing an extreme reading. This is the Pring Bottom Fisher. It's pretty good at helping us to confirm when we're really screaming to the downside and we're looking to see has the market picked some kind of a bottom? Are we gonna be able to bounce up out of that? This is when the Pring Bottom Fisher may give us a helpful signal. And long-term, we have another rainbow going from 50 periods up to 250 periods. And we're still above all of the lines in the rainbow. And the long-term trend continues to be positive. This is the special K. It's a long-term oscillator. We're above this red line and it's going up. So that is positive. And we don't get a lot of signals generated here. So I might mention this in every daily video, but I only show the, video, the chart in this video because it's just saying the same thing over and over. Then we look at a weekly chart of the S&P on top, a weekly chart of the German DAX in the middle, and then we see right now that they're having a pretty strong correlated relationship. They're having a tendency to go in the same direction at the same time. Then we look at the US 10-year yield and subtract the German 10-year yield. Since US rates are higher, that gives us a positive result. And then we plot the US dollar index down below. And sometimes we get, if we get up into this blue area, that means that the top chart and the middle chart are correlating with each other, but right now they're really not. So this chart really isn't helping us. But then we have a thing called the Hindenburg Omen. There was one signal that was generated right at the beginning, beginning of February, but within a certain period of time, tw 20 trading days, there has to be another signal that's generated and there wasn't, and so this is kind of falling off the books. Then some support and resistance. These are Ichimoku clouds. 
these are really just moving averages based on current price and then shifted forward. If we start to fall, sometimes the cloud will act as support. If we're declining and we bounce, sometimes the cloud may act as resistance. We're far away from the cloud now. This is an arithmetic scale or arithmetic, if you want to say it the right way. Most of the charts that we use are based on a log scale. One day, just for kicks, I clicked it over to an arithmetic scale, and we were dancing around this trend line. I went, oh, that's kind of interesting. Well, since that time, we've just shot way above it, and we're far away from this trend line, so there's been no need to show this. Then some broad market measures where we have the VIX that looks at the volatility, volatility of the S&P 500. The VIX in measures the volatility of the NASDAQ 100. There's a lot of icicle looking data here in this video. I mainly follow the line chart, but I really focus on the VIX more because my focus is on the S&P 500. And then we look at a ratio between the QQQs and the diamonds. That's the NASDAQ 100 to the Dow. And they're kind of dropping down a little bit here as we're seeing the NASDAQ 100 under a little bit of pressure these days. So they're not as strong of a relationship as it has been recently. We're keeping an eye on the bank ETF. It continues to be in a longer term uptrend, even though it's pretty much been chopping sideways. We're also watching the regional banking ETF because the New York Community Bank, that's a regional bank. And in on the community tab on the YouTube channel, a week or two ago, I posted a watch list of other banks that may run into trouble at some point. They haven't as of yet, but we don't know if that's going to change at some point. And when the New York Community Bank came out with their news, we really saw this ratio going down. It's really underperforming the financial sector, and it continues to see some weakness here. We had shown enough strength to see a golden cross. Well, with this weakness, now we're seeing a death cross with this ratio. We look at home construction and compare it with three to seven year bonds. This, even though it's pulling back, it's not showing an awful lot of weakness. Home construction is very, very interest rate sensitive. If interest rates were a really big, big, big concern, we would see more of a decline like what we saw over the summer months. We were really going up and then we pulled back. We don't know. It may develop into that. But for right now, we're not seeing an awful lot of weakness. Then we look at the QQQs and also measure it with three to seven year bonds. Yeah, we're pulling back a little bit. But longer term, we still continue to be showing that the NASDAQ 100 is outperforming the three to seven year bonds based on price. Then just, I usually don't show this. This is the Eurozone. This is stocks in the EU and it's continuing to outperform the three to seven year US bond. So stocks in the EU for right now are outperforming at least US bonds. And then we look at another ratio, staples. These are things that you have to have no matter what's going on in the economy. These tend to do better when the market's under pressure. And then tech tends to do better when we're in a more growth environment. When this is going down, that just means the staple sector is really underperforming the tech sector. Not a real surprise there. So I haven't been showing this chart. And it's kind of, if you follow the market very closely, this would only make sense. Just for information, we have some very long range rate of change charts based on 250 periods. We're ticking down a little bit, but overall we have been declining since the early part of 2023. Here's a longer term chart also showing that we're in an uptrend. We are coming up to this blue area where sometimes when we get above this, that can mark some kind of an extreme top. But there's been other times when we go a lot higher than this. So for right now, it's looking positive, but possibly a little extreme positive. Then we keep an eye on bonds. First, we look at one to three year treasury bonds and compare them with three to seven year bonds. They're starting to go back up because we had a strong CPI and PPI, which is kind of freaking out the market right now, thinking that inflation may become a problem. When this was really coming down, the market thought, ah, oh, inflation's under control. The Fed's going to cut rates. When this starts to go back up, that means, uh-oh, maybe they're not going to cut rates like we thought they were going to. And so there's a little more fear coming into the market. And then we look at an inverse here of the seven to 10 year versus the three to seven. When this is going down, that just means that the longer term bonds are out are underperforming when compared to shorter term bonds. Because if you are in the bond market and you're worried about interest rates going up, you want to buy the shortest maturities that you can, because when those mature, you're going to roll them over at a higher interest rate. Then we look at another correlation between the TLT, which is the long term bond ETF and the S&P 500. 
we see that their long-term correlation is improving. It had been really strong for quite a while. Then it really dropped off, but it is going back up. Their short-term correlation has been dropping off, but starting to bounce up a little bit. And then I have a couple of different ways to measure the spread between the two. Not really seeing anything insightful on this chart. Here's the Qs to TLT, where we look at the correlation, where they are having more of a tendency to go in opposite directions of each other right now. But we're seeing it bounce up just a little bit over the past couple of sessions. Here's the yield curve. All of the different yield curves that we follow, the top two, the 10 to the two year and the 10 to the three month, this is what the market mostly pays attention to. They're still inverted for right now. We've been watching some of these for over two years. I, I think it's been that long. And once they go back to not being inverted any longer, then that begins the countdown to see if we're going to go into a recession. So that's why I want to keep a real close eye on this. And then we look at TIPS, which are Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. These are shorter term. In rising interest rate environments, you'll see TIPS outperforming three to seven year bonds. When folks are more confident about interest rates that they may be topping out and coming down, that's when we see this start to underperform. And then here's a little further out, looking at seven to 10 year. And this is a little more pronounced. There's some fear coming back in that maybe interest rates are going to go up. So we're starting to see tips outperforming seven to 10 year bonds. We don't know if this is going to continue or if this is just a short term anomaly. And then eventually the market will fix itself. Interest rates will start to come back down. And we might see this ratio coming back down. And here's one to three month T-bills, which you could pretty much call cash. And we compare that to three to seven year bonds. Where it had been coming down, now it's starting to go back up as there's some interest rate fears in the market. Then we look longer term, here's the S&P and we compare it to three to seven year bonds. Even though we're rolling over a bit here, we still have a really solid uptrend. And when we're above this rainbow, that means the market is still anticipating a soft landing, meaning that we're not going to go into a recession, even though we've seen some economic slowdown. And that's still what the market is hanging on to for right now. And then I have a number of things called possible positive scenarios. And I really use these when we're in a downward move. I use these a lot in 2022. Well, there's still some useful charts that we can make use of even when we're in a more solid uptrend. But then there's some charts that aren't all that useful. So I haven't been including those in the videos. Here is the percent of stocks above their 200-day simple moving average. I use this like an oscillator. There's another study that I look at that is also based on the 200-period simple moving average. And this is not giving us an extreme positive or negative reading. It's still more positive because we're above the midpoint, even though we have been declining lately. Then we do this same basic thing when we measure the S&P 500 and stocks above their 50-period moving average. We got extreme positive right at the end of 2023. We've pulled back. We were starting to come back up, but now we're coming back down. We measure that same thing with the mid caps. So we've been seeing a decline here and the small caps, which have even been even more weaker. And then this is in a 19-day exponential moving average of the advanced decline ratio. We use this like an oscillator, but it's not giving us an extreme reading. So then we say, is price above or below zero? Well, it's above, but it's declining, and volume it's above, but it's also declining. It's positive, but showing some weakness. And then we look at the S&P 500, and we compare that with the two-year treasury yield. Sometimes when this spikes up and starts to come down, that will give good support to the S&P, but now we're in a rising interest rate environment, so this really hasn't been helping us. And then this chart is a ratio between the staples to the S&P. When this is going down, that often gives good support to the S&P. When this is going up, that'll put stocks under pressure. Thank you. I really hope you found this helpful. I'll have another video that I prepare after this called the What to Watch video, where this video talks about the charts I'm not going to really focus on all that much. The What to Watch video tells you about the, start, the charts that I'm really focused on right now. So have a great weekend, and I will talk to you in the next video.